You know, yeah. I've got to say the first time that I realized that flowers were like the reproductive parts of a plant, like the concept of going to the grocery store and buying a bouquet of flowers and bringing it to someone is like, here's a bunch of genitals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So this is my friend Molly. Hey, I'm Molly. I'm a plant biologist. I have a PhD in flowers and I also talk about science on my YouTube channel, Science IRL. Last summer, I spent so many hours in my backyard with only my phone and this attachable macro lens, basically filming anything that I could find. But really, I didn't know a lot of what I was looking at and I knew I would need an expert's help. So I called up Molly. I'll be honest, when I started this venture, I didn't know much about plants. And I, frankly, I feel like I still don't know much about plants. So the relationship between pollination and plants goes back even further than the evolution of flowering plants themselves. When we're talking about back in time, we're talking about back in deep time, like 130 to 198 million years ago. One of the things that I love about plants so much is that they've had to evolve all of these unique adaptations to life in one place, right? So pollination is all about how do I reproduce if I am rooted in the ground and can't go find a mate myself. So animal pollinators help facilitate that. Molly said it works a little something like this. The animal visits the flower looking for a kind of reward, typically nectar or pollen, which is basically flower sperm. As the insect forages for the reward, it picks up pollen that gets transferred onto the next flower it visits. So those orange and yellow things on the bee's legs are actually pollen bags. It's how she'll bring pollen back to the hive. And I just think it's great that they call them pollen bags as though she's gonna go to the store and she's like, I gotta bring my bags. If, except they're not actually bags, it's just pollen attached to her long hairy legs. So if that isn't a metaphor for female beauty, I don't know what is. So the pollen will land on the flower and it germinates what's called a pollen tube down the female reproductive tract of the flower and it'll wind up in the ovary and it'll fertilize an ovule and that will become the little baby plant embryo inside of the ovary. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> like I never realized just how similar plant reproduction is to like a, their kind of reproduction. I mean, you're talking oh, yeah, about- Yeah, flowers, flowers have sex. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah. All right, so some of the most popular and important pollinators have got to be the bees. You knew that was coming. So there are around 4,000 species of native bees in the United States, but that doesn't include the wildly popular honeybees, which aren't native at all. They were introduced by Europeans in the 17th century, and today there are around four species of honeybees compared to 4,000 native bees. And this is where some of those Save the Bees campaigns can be a little bit misleading, because today there are more honeybees on the planet than at any other time in history. There are like definitely really big issues with adding like a monoculture of a, of a foreign species to, to an ecosystem and like waiting to see what happens and depending on it for our food security, for sure. But that doesn't mean that native bees don't need a lot of your help. There are a few hundred different species of bumble and carpenter bees, and they look pretty similar, but one way to tell them apart is that bumblebees have fuzzy abdomens, and carpenter bees are too shy to let you look. I like the tail of two bees here in this rose plant. You have the wildly dramatic uh, bumblebee, <laughs> and then you have the little sweat bee. It's just like, the same size of flower, but it's just so much littler. Oh my gosh, also the long-tongued bees Kind of creepy. That's a very, I mean, it's called a long tongued bee because I think that's fairly obvious. The second largest group of bees are called sweat bees. And despite their appetite for our salty bodily secretions, ew, they are some of the cutest bees, which made me wonder are there any bees that aren't cute? I can't think of any. I think all bees are cute. I think that's one of the prerequisites of being a bee, filling the application out. Are you adorable? Yes. Welcome to the hive. I have some footage of bees like trying desperately to get into flowers that are like sort of closed. Like so much footage, like they're just trying so hard to get in there. Is there a reason why a flower would be like that protective about its pollen and nectar? Definitely, yeah. So sometimes restricting the access a little bit to the flower is a really good way to make sure your pollinator is gonna get like covered in pollen <laughs> trying because it's like flailing around and like fighting its way in there. And so you're like, yeah, you had to struggle, but at least you're covered in pollen now. 
might be surprised to learn, as I was, that after bees, flies are actually the second most important pollinator group. There are estimates of around a million species of flies, and it's still super unclear just how effective they are at pollination because there's so much more research needed. Some flies that seem like unlikely pollinators include blowflies, which are typically attracted by putrid stenches of rotting flowers, decaying things, and poop. They are accidental pollinators in that sometimes they just need a place to land, and a flower provides a pretty good landing pad, and they may pick up pollen on the way. Accidental pollinators. Or intentional. We don't know what they're going through. Maybe they're just tired of eating poop all the time. Who are we to say? My favorite group of flies are called hoverflies, partially because they are professionally deceptive. They get confused for bees a lot because of the similar patterning, but there are some that are so convincing that they can slip into beehives past bees unnoticed where they then lay their eggs in the hive. Hoverfly mouths are basically like sponges at the end of a stick and they just use it to like blah like mop up pollen. It's really cute. That's what this one is doing. Like, meh, meh. I have this book to thank for my newfound appreciation and love for hoverflies. It's called The Fly Trap by Swedish biologist Frederick. I cannot pronounce his last name. It's spelled S-J-U-B-E-R-G. How do you pronounce his name? Yeah, Betty. There you go. Butterflies and moths are popular pollinators. They're less hairy than bees and flies, so they aren't quite as effective, but they do have super cool coiled tongues that they unfurl to drink the nectar out of flowers. And I kind of wish I had that. Caterpillars use different methods of deception and protection in hopes of surviving to the point where they are ready to pollinate something. Just beautiful bug puberty. Some of my favorite caterpillar techniques include the Virginian tiger moth caterpillars urticating hairs. Urtica is Latin for nettle, which is appropriate because these can cause some serious irritation, ranging from mild to deadly. The giant silkworm moth caterpillar is the most venomous in the world, so venomous that they can kill people. I'm also a big fan of the wavy-lined emerald moth caterpillar, aka the camouflaged looper. This thing is one of the most amazing things I witnessed in my backyard. Whatever plant it's living on, it will bite off little pieces of it and stick them onto spikes on its body so that it basically camouflages into its dinner. It is what it eats. And then of course you have the monarch caterpillar, which has these warning colors that should signal to predators that I taste like garbage, except it didn't work because I filmed these super cute monarch caterpillars in my yard. I was so excited that they showed up on my milkweed and then the next day they were gone. And I think they got eaten by the robins. And I was like, didn't you guys talk about this? Who didn't let the robins know? Some robin is out there with a stomach ache and it's not my fault and it's not the monarch's fault. Monarch butterflies get a lot of attention when it comes to pollination stories, partially because milkweed plants are the only thing that monarch caterpillars can consume. In turn, monarchs and other butterflies help pollinate the milkweed plant. There are a lot of other insects that also love milkweed. Mingling among the pollinators, you might see colonies of large milkweed bugs. The juveniles require the seeds of the milkweed plant for nutrients and growth, and they kind of like to clump together in these little family units, which I think is super cute. But mites can also infest milkweed plants. These are not being as kind. I thought they were really cute as well, but they were eating my plants. You might also see longhorn milkweed beetles, which are sometimes called four-eyed beetles, and that's because their antennae bisects their eye. So they have eyes above and below their antennae which is so cool and also really weird. And they're cute. In my backyard, I had a plant called swamp milkweed. And I went out there one morning and it was just swarming with ants. And these ants were so chubby. Like they had just been sitting in these like little cups, just like drinking nectar until they were so big. You could literally see through their abdomens. They were just like, so they were just so happy, fat and happy. So guy. happy for them. <laughs> right, it's not for them. But then I'm like, these ants were so hostile to anything that got near it. They were like biting the legs of the milkweed beetles. But I'm thinking about insects like the monarch that really is dependent on the milkweed and the pollen and the nectar. So what is happening? And like, the, are the ants considered a pest? Is this relationship no longer mutualistic? What is going on? Yeah, so so far we've only talked about like happy hunky-dory flower <laughs> pollinator relationships. 
You can have a little plant that's sitting there like making pollen and nectar for its intended pollinator, but then a different insect comes along and robs the nectar. And so the insect gets the reward in that case and it hasn't pollinated the plant. So the plant loses and the insect wins. And I think that's probably what's going on with the milkweed in your yard. Rude! Is there any kind of benefit at all, like, for the milkweed? There could potentially be a benefit almost if these plants are relying on what's called outcrossing, like they have to send their pollen elsewhere to reproduce. And so maybe it's better if your butterfly is forced to visit lots of different flowers. These complex plant and pollinator interactions have taken tens of millions of years to develop. What I love so much about this story is that it just took a few new tools to open up a whole new world. That was right in my backyard. It was there the whole time. You can go check it out too. Not in my yard. Please don't come in my backyard. So plant native plants when possible, like these are species plants, not the hybrids or the fancy varieties that we like to breed. As pretty as they are, they're not great for pollinators. Get some moth plants, get some hummingbird plants, get some bee plants, and you can, you can attract a, a big variety of pollinators to your garden. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Stay tuned for my next video where I'm going to be sharing more about my art process and how I've been turning this footage into paintings. Thank you to our production partners, the Described and Captioned Media Program, they create high quality accessible media for teachers and students with disabilities. You can learn more on their website at dcmp.org. And as always, a massive thank you to our patrons for making Art Lab possible. If you'd like to also support Art Lab, you can join us over on Patreon, patreon.com slash Emily Grassley. Stay tuned for more. Okay, thanks. Goodbye.